Hi friends, here robot number one here. On this episode of the Corpus Animus podcast, we forgot to film an intro. Kyle and Brandon talk about chocolate, cooldowns, building yourself a support team, and more CrossFit open stuff. Train along some of the best athletes in the world at the sport of CrossFit. To get a free sample week of our current training cycle, head over to trainingthinktank.com slash DSGN. So many things going on. That's going to keep going forever until I touch it again. Okay. You were talking, and I, I think the audience would love to hear this. Your, your history of candy bars in oh. the U.S. Okay. So hold on. Before you say that, the yeah. start of this hold conversation. On, how did this even come up? This is, okay. we're just talking. This, this show. Well, Brandon and I both like history, right? Yeah. I, love, I love like it. apparently history of food. <laughs> <laughs> I do too, but I, I've been on this kick of reading all these Cold War stories, which have fascinated me. Yeah, I, I like it. So it turns out I'm not mostly interested in the history of food, but this, <laughs> this thing popped up. I was looking for something that my whole family could watch and I was looking through history channel and it was the foods that made America. And it turns out it was candy bars and fast food. That's what, it, that was my point yeah. though. It's so funny that that, and it is true, <laughs> right? Like, you, wait, is that really though? The foods that made America or is that, Hey, here's some interesting things we can make yeah, a show the out first of. First Thanksgiving, it was, it was Mars bars and uh, Hershey's <laughs> kisses. And that's all folks. Good, good podcast. Yeah. Thanksgiving hosted or sponsored by Mars bars. So what interesting <laughs> did you learn? A, a lot. Well, first off, did you know the peanut was originally marketed as this like Aztec health food? I found that to be absolutely fascinating. Yeah, nothing has changed. Think yeah. about you going to like the health food store and it's just like, this will help your libido. Yeah, the this Aztec, is, Aztec yeah. libido food. <laughs> oh, come get your Aztec I peanut. I know what that's in. called. Yeah, exactly. That's called Maca. That's what it is. But see, that's what I'm saying though. Like the research though, I've looked up all these things. I actually, for everybody watching. Right. History with brain. I feel like we have said nothing yet. <laughs> Can you at least give us one fun fact about the history of he the Mars did. bar? I did, the peanut. Okay. Yeah. Um, Man, I told Brandon all the most interesting stuff before we actually started talking about it. But well, the cool one was the lady that, or the she I, had the I refrigerant patent, and yeah. the so U.S. tried to sue her. Here's how it worked. So basically, this guy he inherited a bunch of money, and he didn't really want to do anything. So he went into Canada, and he would base he was basically living off the land in a cabin, and he was fishing, and he would catch fish, and they would freeze so fast up in I don't know like boreal forest or wherever he was, they would freeze so fast. And when he would start reheating them, they would come back alive. And he's like, dude, I absolute nuts. I need to figure out how to freeze foods like this so that foods can be fresh when people cook them. So he came back, used his money to basically invent flash freezing. But the problem was he invented a technique. Nobody had freezers. So he had frozen food, but nobody had freezers at their house. So he invented a product for a market that didn't exist. Well, this lady had inherited another candy bar company and I cannot for the life of me remember what it was. Maybe it was Nestle or so- something like that. Let's say payday. She inherited payday. <laughs> mm, those are actually her, pretty good. Her last name, whatever it was, is the name of the company. And you guys would all know it if I could remember it off the top Hershey's. of Hershey's. Nope. It wasn't Hershey's. Nestle. Nope. Uh, no, she bought Nestle. Like, For those that know, yeah. post in the comments. What's the one that makes the ones that come out at Easter? <laughs> those Cadbury one with the, eggs? Cadbury. Cadbury. No, it wasn't. She a Cadbury? Anyway, she she basically saw the value in this and paid an exorbitant amount of money for the, the entire company, including the patents for this flash freezing thing. Fast forward to World War II, they needed to ship frozen food across and she had all the patents on how to freeze food. So she made so much money. So she went from being filthy rich to like filthy, filthy, filthy rich. Yeah, she was the Bezos of the time. Yeah. And the other cool thing about her is like at the time she was one of the only female CEOs in the entire world. It was like unheard of. And she basically came in and the, like the board of the company, they were going to try and kick her out. And she basically was like, screw you guys. Oh, oh hell no. Hell no. I, and that now is bird's eye food. Or is uh, that one of the Bird's eyes, one of the things that they yeah. own. I mean, you think about it though, like we, you go down the freezer aisle at your local grocery store and everything's flash frozen now. Yeah. Or almost everything. The, oh man, more, more fun facts from this. This is all from one episode. So if you guys are- Hey, hold on real channel, quick. Let's keep this going. Cause I actually yeah. like this. But if you hate this and you're like, man, this is supposed to be a CrossFit podcast and you're talking about <laughs> chocolate, let us know in the comments and we won't ever do this again. <laughs> No, we'll so, get there. Okay. Here's, here's what I learned. Same thing. Her company paid for the installation of those freezers and refrigerators at the grocery store so sense. that they could hold their food. So yeah. that they literally could put those foods in front of people's right. faces. But they knew that that was going, it was, there was a return on investment right. that was coming it's later. The same thing that Apple did with the exactly. iPad, man, where yep. they were like, 
there was no market. Nobody needed a tablet, yep. but they were like, check out this thing yeah. that you need. It's they, a and they were giving them away. <laughs> they were giving yeah. them away to companies and, and schools and everything else. And now they pay for them every year. It's like your the phone. kids use iPads at, at school. You better believe it. Uh, Microsoft Har- has Harper a huge- doesn't use iPads. They use computers. Yeah. But, yeah. I mean, uh, Apple has a big stock in public education. And, yeah. And I remember so as Microsoft. a kid, we had um, Apples growing up, like uh, the old, Same. like, yeah. you know, nasty gray white ones. And you would just play, uh, what was that game where you, it was just a game of chance, but it was like, you were like a pilgrim. I, uh, Oregon, Trail. Trail. Oregon Trail. Oregon Trail. Oregon Trail. God, oh that was my, my God. favorite you, game. You just die of dysentery every <laughs> yeah. time. <laughs> You'd get so close. Like, <laughs> why was that ever I'd supposed be in to be Idaho. fun? Dude, they still sell that game. They have it. They have like Has a it improved handheld version of that. It's probably Target. so much better now. No, it's exactly well, the same. The same better? graphics. So I'm, I'm saying the graphics. graphics. <laughs> it's the exact same thing. It's like a stick figure walking across the prairie. <laughs> I mean, the best part was when you got to like shoot your, your, um, uh, food. Yeah. The deer would run across. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I loved it, man. But then what are you going to do? You can't flash freeze it. Oh, uh, it's nostalgic. You eat, eat all that food or you salt smoke it. it. Yeah. Right. Smoke what were you dry. about to get into? Before I, I made him go back to his chocolate. I don't remember to be completely he was honest. Like, I like the cold more. Uh, oh, well, I, he, we were just chatting off camera about what we've been reading. And I've been reading about George Blake, who's like the biggest, he was the biggest double agent for the Russians, but he was an SIS member. So MI6. Double, double agent, which means he was employed so, by the Russians and the US. And, and the British. He's a spy for okay. So he, okay. Yeah, well, no, I, I, is that not a double agent? Basically he was, he worked for MI6. And he like was James Bond, James Bond style. And the Russians basically got to him and said like, Hey, can you work for I wonder us? how they got to him or he hot Russian lady? Maybe <laughs> he went to them because he b- believed in communism. And, and this was in the, the late forties, early fifties. It's just wild though, because basically this, the whole story unravels where he's been slowly leaking them information. But the biggest thing that happened was for those that like history, the U S and the UK built a tunnel underneath the, where the Berlin wall became kind of like the well-known area. Right. right. And they tapped into the cables for the USSR at the time so that they could listen to every single thing. Well, they didn't know it at the time, but George Blake got that file on his desk, took a picture with these tiny little cameras they have like James Bond style yeah, like- and sent it to the KGB. And then they knew, well, so Russia was so tactical with the way they did things. The KGB didn't tell anybody else in the USSR. So they, they were still tapping the USSR's cables for the next two years because the KGB didn't want to give up Blake because they thought he would have more information to come out that would be even more important it's just a wild story but just finished that book what was the book called i don't know i the first one i read was spy master and i will tell you what the name of this one is when i was a kid betrayal in berlin we had you said they tapped into the phone system yeah or whatever we had my uh my cousin came and lived with me he was 18 and he had a girlfriend and they were going to college so we put them up for a year so they could go to college nearby mm, you picked up the phone line and listened to their dirty well, no, no, talk no, no. Oh, no, no. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so his girlfriend that came with him her dad used to be a cop and she just had like some stuff from him one of them was like a walkie-talkie and we turned on the walkie-talkie once <clears throat> and it was like picking up phone calls in the neighborhood and i was like oh what the heck? you know i'm like nine or ten and you would only be able to latch on to the first one it picked up. So if, if, if I picked up y'all's phone call, I couldn't go to another call until y'all hung up and then it would just pick up the next one. I was like, what the crap is happening? And I heard so much wild shit. <laughs> I mean, this was back in like, w- w- when did that I'm blue? Da, ba, dee, da. When did that come <laughs> oh, out? That was 99? Yeah, it was something like, like that. Late nineties. Yeah. Yeah. I was hearing like some teenage girls and guys having like little phone sex on there. <laughs> I heard the craziest thing I heard. You think that's crazy. Craziest thing I heard was two old women playing cards over the on phone. the phone no. where they Good had split them. the deck and then made sure that they weren't uh, using the same cards. I don't know what they were. And then they were playing some card game. <laughs> All right, I got a seven. And What's, it was like, oh, that, can that we hurry up time. and hang up so we can get back to the phone set? Which, which is stranger? <laughs> Chris listening to two old ladies <laughs> play cards <laughs> on a phone screen, Dude, it was, which I didn't no, no, even know. You would have existed. done the same thing. This was so fascinating. And yeah. I also heard my neighbor's Christmas presents and I spoiled it for him. Oh man. His parents you're were like, that guy. yeah, we got him a Nintendo, whatever it was. And I told him, I was like, Hey dude, you're getting a Nintendo. <laughs> How do you know? I didn't even Can't know tell that, you. I, I didn't know that you could have done that back in the nineties. We like, didn't either. That's Shh. yeah. That's I, fucked. I'll, Give you the benefit of the doubt. I probably would have listened to <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> to the old ladies yeah. playing cards, for sure. Yeah, I mean, you just feel like, speaking of spies, you feel like you're a spy. 
I used Man. to play it all the time. But even back at Chris, your, when, on home phones, Chris. you would just pick up your home phone, and if you were quiet enough, you could hear. Other you things. could listen I, to your parents talking or you, whoever. Yeah. You know how valuable that would be right now if we could like go tap HQ's phone and be like, oh, <laughs> we could. <laughs> what are release, the workouts? We could release on our podcast. What, yeah. What twenty one point one? Is this your way to segue back to CrossFit? <laughs> no, I'm they just thinking to myself out. that would be like, oh yeah, for sure. They would ruin us. They'd be like, all right, first one has single. <laughs> the open is well when this comes out a day away. Next, no, two. Next Wednesday? No, well, it's not next no. week. Yeah. No, it'll come out. One week. One week after this podcast. Oh, one week released. after this. One week yeah. and one day after so this we're podcast close. is released. Yeah, we are close. Damn. Are y'all feeling the pressure? Like of your, so y'all, how many athletes do y'all currently individual coach for? 32. 32. I'll have 34 doing the open. Oh, Brandon's the winner. Good job, Are Brandon. you, how, how's everybody feeling? Are you feeling the pressure coming? Are people excited? What's going on? I think for the population that I coach, most people, the vast majority, so like out of the 30 that I have that are doing the open, probably 28 are all very comfortable that they'll be able to pass through to stage two. So the pressure isn't on yet. Now for the two that are on the edge, they do both have goals of making it through into that top 10%. So the pressure is mounting for them. Um, But I think for the most part, people are pretty relaxed. They have like, they have their head, head on straight, like, I've communicated them. Do you like, think that that's going to make for a more fun open? The fact that I people do. are relaxed? Yeah. Or yeah, more it's going to be way relaxed? less stressed. Well, I think the first stage one will be more relaxed, but then you get into stage two and obviously it's going to be much more challenging, especially for those that are kind of like your bubble. I say bubble, bubble top 120 in North America or top 60 in Europe, wherever yep. that is. But that's a select few, right? Like those are the best of the best. I, I love that. And Max and I talked about this a couple of weeks ago, but I love the top 10% because it does allow <laughs> more people to get through and have at least an extra couple of weeks or an extra stage that they can go to and, and you know set new goals or whatever it may be. The, I think there's kind of two ways to look at the open and maybe this is kind of a place that we can start talking about open expectations for those that are bubble athletes. As far as top 10% goes, they're going to have to look at stage one a little bit different than maybe like your best guys and girls who are really thinking forward to maybe even the semifinals, right? Yep. What would, what are the recommendations that you're giving? Because I have a couple of those too, right? Like the top 10%, they're, they're all through maybe 20 something or 30 of those athletes, but then there are a few that it's going to be tough. What are the recommendations first? Let's start with the people that are going to have to repeat workouts and, or are just going to be really close. What are you telling them? I think that's the first thing is that plan on having to repeat these workouts because the other people that are in that same 10% bubble range, they're going to plan on repeating it. Don't put yourself at a a disadvantage. That means that on Friday, when you do your initial attempt, you need to have a good plan going into it. And, you know, we've talked in this podcast, the Corpus Santos podcast, numerous times about how to have effective planning, effective strategy, you know, strategizing and things like that. But that's a huge factor, you know, get the, co- the competitor's manual, spend time filling that out. It's three weeks. You're going to fill that out three times. Really, it, it is worth your time investment to do that. And that is on the front page of the website right now. If you're watching the video version, yeah. you can see oh, it well, right now. Look at that. Hey, Cal. Cal, yeah, I, up house. I think that, you know, obviously maybe the, it's a little too late now with this coming out a week before, but I've been telling all my athletes that are bubble athletes that they need to be practicing the run throughs several weeks before this, right? Agreed. So like that for the last four or five throwdowns, they basically been prepping in a way that they're thinking about, I'm doing the throwdown. I'm recovering as hard as I can, as hard as I can afterwards. Yep. I'm thinking about Sunday as a recovery day. And then Monday, even though they're not retesting the throwdown workout, I give them another hard workout to pretend like they're retesting what, what the we open. call pattern repeats. Right. Exactly. Right? So they're basically, if they did a bunch of chest to bar and dumbbell snatches in, or let's just use this week's throwdown, dumbbell yeah. snatches and burpee box and overs, then maybe they're doing touch and go snatches and exactly. bar facing burpees on Monday. So a right. pattern repeat. Now it's too late to try and uh, habituate <laughs> yeah. yourself to that. At this <laughs> Do point. it every day this week. <laughs> but I, I did the same thing. It's funny. Uh, about three weeks ago, I sent an email out to every single one of my athletes, even the ones that stage one isn't high pressure. Right. And it was like, Hey, you guys need to start being a little more intentional with your planning when you're doing these Saturday throwdowns or you're like, I often will have athlete athletes do a Wednesday hard tester, yeah. some, some sort of old CrossFit workout or, you know, open workout or a broken version of a workout they did last year or something like that. And then Saturday's a big, yeah. you know, another dose with a throwdown. And it's like, be intentional with those, write yeah. out your, your competitor's manual, review your video, do all the things you're planning to do so that it's practiced so that it feels like second nature when it, when right. it matters. Yeah. I say, get, tr- get rid of as many of the unknowns as possible. There will be plenty when Castro starts <laughs> riding out the workouts, right? He always throws a curveball, or maybe there's two workouts in one week, whatever that may be. But for us, like, let's take 
care of all the other things, all the things that we know that we have in our control, our nutrition, which I know you and Becky touched on, but maybe we can touch on that again. The sleep patterns that you have. So don't do anything crazy with that leading up to the open. You mean don't add three hours of sleep per night? Or, you know, like other people just get super anxious and, or something that you said that maybe you should add is like mindfulness, mindfulness meditation or anything like that. Guided any kind relaxation. Of med- yeah. yeah, exactly. So th- ways to learn how to calm yourself down, try to get the same sleep pattern, same nutrition, the same way that you warm up and cool down. Like it, changing all that now doesn't make a lot of sense. The one thing I think, and you mentioned this before we were on air, but that you could change is movement patterns. So, and especially something simple like a thruster where I can widen my stance maybe a little bit, widen my hands if it's going to shorten my range of motion. Those are little things, but Practicing transitions in and out of the rower. For like, sure. That's a huge, there is so much time lost. Now, granted in the open, there isn't going to be a rower, but yeah. for those of stage you who do two. pass on to stage two, like I have watched people lose a minute in a workout, like 18 one where you're on and off the rower over and over and yeah. over. I've watched people lose a minute, just getting their feet into the rower and like tightening down the straps every time, yeah. little things like that. Like that now is the time to spend time practicing those transitions or getting into your first double under with a double versus a single again, not going to be in the open, but yeah, well, maybe it will. Well, no, I think that you will see some kind of double under. I don't know. They said that HQ posted yesterday very clearly that there were going to be no double unders in the open. Yeah. But that may mean it is singles or speed steps or or, stage two. Yeah. Something like that. So people need to be prepared for all those things. Why did they make a hard stance on that? I don't know. They put up something about Bob. Bob is a CrossFitter who can't do double unders, but he still signed up for the open. I think they're trying to drive people to yeah. sign up for the open. I think that that almost solidifies my thought. And Max said this to the staff that you may see a single or a speed step. So I've given it to a lot of my athletes. And for those watching, maybe that's something. Singles are hard when you're so used to double <laughs> yeah. unders. It just, it will just be an impediment. Uh, the people that are top 10% will still be able to do it, but I agree. Like if, if you start tripping a ton and then all of a sudden you freak out and maybe you do have to retest a workout because of that. I like singles. It took me a long time to learn to do double unders yeah. when I started. So I spent a lot of time doing, you know, fast singles and everything. So I got yeah. a lot, a lot yeah. of early speed experience. steps though can be challenging. If yeah. it, they get in your head and then all of a sudden you start tripping a ton or you can't get them done, you know, maybe right leg or left leg, it has some issues. Like I know my left leg doesn't bounce as, as fast as my right. So sometimes that can, especially if it's like a 20 minute AMRAP, if we're going back to those, that would be tough. I just learned how to do speed steps last <laughs> Thursday. <laughs> yeah. I heard you I'm, talking about it. I'm not terrible. I'm also not good. At <laughs> so, good enough. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the, the first can we get t- a team team workout where they do the what is it double dutch or where like you know multiple oh, you people are holding the rope? The rope? Oh man! Oh, that would be sick the if down. they did that. Three person teams for the throwdown where you got to accumulate like a hundred one just one two. person in the is middle. Is it called double dutch? Is I, that what's I, called? I don't know. I don't know if it is. That's what I'm thinking. It might be jump rope people. Please correct jump us. Jump rope team. Yeah, Molly can can help us with that. Yeah. The, what, else, what else can we do? Yeah, well, I, I think just going back, the first step would be you should have already been been scrimmaging these things. That's kind of the way that I say it. Like, you know, I played football, you swam. You at some point have to do the thing that you're going to do in the sport. Yeah, and so you guys did scrimmages, we did mock meets. Right, exactly. I mean, it's, and that's the same thing where I'm putting myself in the pressure, but not only the workout. I think some people just think I'm going to do more Metcons. It's also the before and after that I'm thinking about and all the recovery modalities and the sleep and the nutrition. I'm trying to dial in all of those things things. I'm thinking too, even more detailed of I'm going to do the open workout at 9am. So then what does that mean? What time am I waking up every single Friday? What time am I going to sleep every single Thursday? What is my timing for my nutrition? If you really want to dial these things in, even if you're not a serious athlete, I think those are just simple steps that you can take five or six weeks out to kind of plan for that. Well, you mentioned recovery modalities. I know what my favorite are, right? So I get done with an open workout. And the first thing I do is I go get on that concept two bike and I turn that damper down as low as it'll get. And I just sit there and kind of stew in whatever... (laughs) Uh, suffering. I just, <laughs> I just put myself through it. And like, I do that until I feel okay. Focusing on nose breathing, just trying to relax myself and get myself calmed down. Then I hop on a foam roller and try and just hit like a full body foam roll, 10, 15 minutes. Sometimes I'll spend 20 minutes on yeah. that. Uh, and then I do some, some guided relaxation breathing. That's been my go-to. Why is the, re- why is the cool down so important? And why do so many people skip it? Well, I guess I know why so many people skip okay, it. Well, it's freaking boring as hell. It's not even boring. <laughs> Most people don't realize because it, it only makes you feel marginally better in the moment. Yeah. Most people don't connect how much better they feel a day or two days later, how much better they feel from having done that, that cool down. Plus most of the time they're training hard all the time. Is there anything after, else in life that's analogous to this, that, that would really make this point shine? Yes. Putting money in your savings account, right? <laughs> 
Yeah. Like, obviously it sucks in the moment. You're like, yeah, I want that. No, I don't mean I something that, that sucks ranger. in the moment. That's better later. I'm talking about you do something. And then after you do something, you do something again, but a little less intense. And then that makes you better uh, going forward instead of just coming to a complete stop. Well, I mean, <laughs> brushing your teeth twice a day, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> and even get what I'm asking. Yes, no, I, I do. do. I don't think it's perfectly analogous to that, but I do think, like you said, the savings account's a perfect example. Like it's a little bit of pain doing it, but then over time you're like, okay, this makes sense. But if I told someone, Hey, someone comes to me and they say, I want a 300 pound bench and I'm at a hundred pounds right now. And I, and I say, well, you do three sets of 10, but then after each of those, you just do one cool down set, whatever that is. And then all of a sudden they got to 300 pounds in you know, six months, obviously I know that's ridiculous, but everybody would do that. It's the same way when we talk about recovery modalities of if you're going to feel better where you can squat clean two days later and still get that better or do another hard Metcon two days later without being sore or at least a little less sore, which gives you more intensity on that second day, then you're going to get better at the sport. But people don't look at it that way. They always think, oh, it's just a waste of my time. I got to hurry and go do the next thing that I'm supposed to do. Also in training, I don't necessarily want people to cool down after every training session. I only want them to cool down after very specific training sessions. Like if, if someone has three sessions in a day, I don't want them spending 20 minutes cooling down after their AM strength session. Right. I would rather them just kind of like, de like let, let some of the inflammation and things like that kind of do its job in the body and let the cool down serve its purpose on like, if they're training Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I might not have them cool down until, you know, the Wednesday PM session and then spend a long time on that cool down. So that Thursday is like a real recovery day. So they're, you know, kind of set their bodies up to recover well versus yeah. in a competitive scenario where, especially if you're someone who is going to be repeating the workout, you don't really have a choice, but to, to yeah. do those recovery you modalities. You need to get ready for that Monday retest. Yeah. If you test on Friday and then you get a retest on a Monday, you have to be ready for that. And if you're still wrecked on Monday, then it's it's not, I mean, it's hard to beat your last score unless it's just like a huge pacing error on Friday. Yeah. And there's uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that a lot of people think like, oh man, if I cool down, I'll be less sore tomorrow. But cool downs don't necessarily make you less sore. They just make it so that you can perform better through that soreness. And that may be another reason that people tend to skip them. It's because they'll do a cool down once. They're like, it didn't change how sore I was. Yeah. You're right, but it did change your performance. You can still be extremely sore and and perform better. Like soreness isn't necessarily equated to poor performance. Yeah. One of the things I like to use in cool downs is actually like movement flows. So I'll do the same thing. I'll get on the C2 bike or an assault bike. So I'm kind of moving my arms as well and calm myself down. And then I'll spend time kind of testing and retesting the positions that I want to get in, especially like yeah. after my knee surgery back in May, I really spent a lot of time trying to get into the bottom of a squat after I did anything that was intense. And so I'm like, okay, can I sit there? Can I rock onto that surge surge? surgically repaired leg? Can I get into deep ankle flexion? Where are my shoulders at? And so I just like pick six or seven movements, set a clock for 15 minutes. I'm going through those at a very low intensity, but bottom of squat holds, rocking back and forth into some kind of shoulder flexion test, into maybe shoulder extension, into some thoracic work, and just kind of play with that. So especially for your older athletes, master's athletes that have mobility restrictions or some younger athletes that have mobility restrictions, that may be a good way to kind of, you know, whatever, kill two birds with one stone. This highlights how different our physiologies are, because if I were to do that, if I tried to do static stretching or even mobility flow style, uh, work after a training session, the likelihood that I would cramp and make it counterproductive. <laughs> Cause if I get a, like example, if I get a quad cramp, if I get a VMO cramp, I will literally be like prohibitively sore yeah. for five or six days afterward to the point that I'm like, I'm probably going to tear my, <laughs> tear my VMO. But like, if I were to get into deep knee flexion after a, a workout, doesn't matter what the workout is, the likelihood that my hamstring just completely balls up and it, like it negates the purpose of doing that. It just, it's funny how like the set of cool down modalities that yeah. I've arrived at is very different than the set of cool down modalities that you've arrived at versus someone who's like way more enduring. If you take Mia, who's a way more enduring athlete than you and I are, you know, you and I are much more, you know, powerful, uh, you know, more explosive athletes. I bet Mia's recovery modalities look like go drive home. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I, I think that that's to the point of it's going to change for every person. It's going to be a little bit different. There are some general things I think everyone can kind of follow, but that also comes like, you've got to cell phone those things. Like you got to figure them out yourself. I, people all the time in the design or individual clients are always asking for warmups and I give them general structures, but I'm like, at, at some level, you have to own your own training and figure out what works best for you. And I also think just- And is the, the best way to do that, to play around with lots of them to I th see? I think so. Shotgun. Shotgun approach, because you're, there are people who are going to 
rather uh, than looking for the perfect one, just do a whole bunch and then yeah. kind of see and figure out which ones stick. That's yeah. where, I, I mean, I've been doing this for, I've been competing at a high level for like, Jesus, 20 years. Wow. I'm, but I'm then really I think old. the natural qu next question would be like, well, okay, I did a whole bunch. These are the ones I like. I still would like to know that this is effective and I'm not wasting my time and not just that I like it. With cool down modalities and things that are just generally designed to improve your recovery, if you feel better, generally, that's a pretty good indicator that it is helping you. Because let's face it, I look at it like this. I like my Norma Tech boots. And whether or not the research tells me that the Norma Tech boots are actually improving my recovery the next day, I'm still in the middle of a competition going to go get my Norma Tech boots because when I'm done with a 20 minute or 30 minute Norma Tech session, my legs feel better and I feel more confident that I can go compete again and perform better. So I could give two shits whether or not the, re you know, Sandy, Dr. Sandy, whatever's research paper tells me that my Norma Tech boots are working. I feel like they're working. They feel like they're working and my legs feel better when I'm going into my next workout. So I'm going to do it. Yeah. Even so if you're it's almost a placebo like, effect. Um, you're almost giving more weight to your mental side a of subjective it. Subjective side. Yes. Like yeah. you'd rather feel good about it than know that it. I feel works. like that's such a large part of sport in general. Like there are some things that you just can't be subjective about. Right. But if I, you know, I'll use a golf analogy since I went and lost to Max and Adam yesterday. But you lost, yeah, we Travis and I got beat the last two oh, holes. This sh so this should have been the topic. A, of this a perfect podcast. example of hey, what this. was the hole on putt uh, seventeen or the putt on hole seventeen like? It was brutal. I hit a perfect putt and just lipped out. It was exactly where I wanted it. I have a little note was, here. Max told me to ask you yeah. about it on the podcast. <laughs> Man, I played, it sucks because I played so well yesterday and then had back to back triple bogeys. All right, go back to your example. So, Sorry. Anyhow. Um, if you talk to pros or you listen to pros, the one thing that they always say to amateurs is set an intention, like have a focus on the task and then just believe in yourself when you're doing that. And I know that that's a little bit different than just like subjective fee feel or feedback from, you know, maybe cooling down. But the, the idea behind that would be believe that it's working and then it's going to start working with, with my swing in the same way. If I go up and I, and I'm trying to PR my snatch. If I'm thinking about all the things that I could do wrong, I'm most likely going to miss. But if I start believing in myself and visualizing that it's going to work, it starts working. So the same thing of a lot of the subjective stuff in the sport allows us to kind of start believing in ourselves a little bit more. And even if it's not, you know, hey, there's no good research on, there are some things that maybe we shouldn't talk about that on. But if there's no good research, but it's making me feel better, that may be a good option for you. Yeah, I and think maybe that's why the shotgun approach works because it helps you find something that you believe in better. It helps you find the the set of tools that make you feel good. And when you feel good, you tend to perform better. Yeah. I think it just comes down to that. Uh, one of the things that I found working with athletes in the old, I, I wish this wasn't the old system, but the old sanctional system was coming up with a recovery flow after every single workout. Like you have the same routine. When I say flow, I mean a routine that you do after every single event. So you get done with the event, you walk back to your, you walk back to your bag, you drink your recovery shake before you know, you, you get on the massage table as soon as possible. You need to set up your appointment before you go out to do your event you get them to flush your legs out or flush your arms out or whatever. Then when you're done with that, if they have showers on site, you go, you take a shower, then you go back and you sit and you like, you know, lay around and maybe take a nap or you do some guided relaxation. Then you spend 20 minutes going and talking to your family real quick. And then you come back and you put your, you know, you put your mind to the next event. And like you go through that routine over and over and over and it, it's treating yourself like a professional, yeah. right? Versus what most people do when they go to a competition, which is like, get done with the event, shoot the shit with everybody. And like, yeah, that's fun. But having fun and performing well are not necessarily the same thing. If you're someone who wants to go to the top levels of the sport, training can be fun. Those things can be fun. But the reality is like, you have to treat yourself like a professional. Well, if nothing else, I feel if it seems like the routine would get you out of your head. So you yeah. wouldn't be sitting there thinking, what should I do? Should I do this? blah, blah, if you, I'm just following the routine. Yeah. yeah. Same thing every time. Yeah. Which and has to be helpful in a game day scenario, I'd assume not being it, wondering all this. I think it's the same thing for stage one in the open. Yeah. You I was going to say it goes right back to that. And stage two is going to be even more important because potentially six, I mean, if I just think back to the age group qualifier for 2020, right? It was six events in five days. Yeah. And I can guarantee that Castro is probably going to pack more than that in for the non-masters division. Yeah. And so those people are like, you're going to have to do two, maybe three events in the same day. So having some sort of planned and practiced routine to go to between your events. And if you have that down 
to a, a personal subjective science. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm not talking about like a right. science science, but a personal subjective like flow, you're going to be at an advantage for sure. Yeah, I agree. I think that that, especially for those that are going to repeat on stage one or everyone that gets to stage two, when you get to stage two, those are like, that's the time where you have to really dive in and make sure that you have a good routine. Do you think outside of the top 20, five or 30 athletes in the world that anyone's going to be able to get through stage two without repeating? It just depends on how they structure those workouts. But I don't, I think everyone, <laughs> there are maybe in North America, 400 guys that could all make it yeah. just depending on the workouts. So you think top 120, well, that means the remainder of those are all fighting for those maybe last 15 or 20 spots. All of those guys are going to have to repeat. So maybe the, the bottom 300 of those 400 guys are going to have to repeat every or a couple of the five or six workouts that come out. I just remember. So last year was my first age group qualifier. And I remember how dead I was on the final day on Monday. Yeah. And I had to repeat. I think I repeated two workouts. I had to make up one because yeah. we had some travel stuff because mm -hmm. we'd gone to Canada for the Atlas games that were right. canceled and, yep. and all that. Uh, but I just remember being so dead but somehow still finding, you know, you know yep. what I mean? Finding two reps here and a rep here on some of the repeats. And like, people are going to have to be able to find that. Well, that's the other thing is maybe two reps could be 30 or 40 spots. Like we don't know. So that's going to be worth it. For me to move into the top 20. So I think I was 33rd or 35th, something like that. So for me to move into the top 20, which would have been a qual, it was 33 double unders. Yeah. So 15 seconds. Yeah. Right. And, and it, that's how tight it is. And, and that's how tight it will be in all of the divisions, not just like one master's division, but like the, the 34 and under definitely going to be tight. That was in the master's division with only 200 people, yeah. right? So top 10% for open males and open females, oh. that's going to be a huge field. For sure. That 33 double unders would be a lot more than, you know, 15 spots overall on the leaderboard. That's going to be more like hundreds of spots yeah. on the leaderboard. Another thing that it, it probably mattered more when there was five weeks of the open um, but I think it still matters for those that are fighting for a top 10% is stay in the, st keep your focus on the next workout. I think what happens is like, I, and you see this on the leaderboard every year, everyone does event one, right? And then the week two, all of a sudden there was like 140,000 guys that signed up last year and then 120 did week two. And then week three, it was like 85,000 people did it. It's like people are just dropping, right? And it's because they come, they'll work, they bomb a workout or the workout, they, they have something that they don't like and then they get disappointed. Stay, keep your focus in it and stay kind of set on, I'm going to finish all three of these workouts. I'm going to make sure that I push myself because you never know what's going to happen. All it takes is one really good workout to offset one really bad workout to get top 10%. It's true. I, you know, typically for me, the last week of the open has been one of my best ones. So if I had like checked out on week three or four, when I have my bad workout, well, then I would have never had the opportunity to turn in my best score, which is usually like my saving back in the day when, when it was regionals, it would be like my saving grace. I'm like, Oh, I squeaked in yeah. with a good final workout. And um, the, it'll all <laughs> average out too. So like yep. Max and I talked about what it takes to be in the top 10% a couple of weeks ago on the podcast. One of the things we didn't really touch on is there were guys that made what would have been top 10% in 2020 that had workouts that were the bottom 50% but Seriously? Then, yeah. But then all of a sudden they just had a couple really good ones and then some average ones and that averaged out because other people quit. Wow. So as long as you don't and you finish those in, and especially if let's say there's two workouts in one week. So now there's four scores or five scores. It's going to matter even more. On that same note, approaching the open for someone who more than likely is not going to make it through to stage two, but, um, isn't just doing the open for fun. What's some like advice you have for those people? Like, Hey, I'm doing it to, be better in the future, but I'm not going to make it through any specific tips for the, that crowd. Yeah. I mean, it's practice. So this is the, this is your one time a year to practice against the entire world. So even though it may be disappointing when you finish 50,000th and you wanted to be top 20,000 or whatever it may be, it gives you an opportunity to be able to see where you're at. And then especially if you have a coach, they can then run through the workouts with you and say, here are the things on a performance standpoint that we need to get better at. Like you, you're good at this in training, but for some reason you didn't do well, what's going on? Like, what was the limitation? And then you can give your coach that subjective feedback. And then your coach can take that and then say, okay, here's the, the training plan to kind of build these things up. I, I think also looking at that, like those athletes are clearly novice athletes, but they might be really motivated to get better in the sport. And I think if you don't have a coach, one of the best things that you can do is to hire someone that's as invested in your progress and success as an athlete, as you are, yeah. right? That's like the best thing that you can do. If I 
when I talk to elite athletes that come on board with me, guys that have aspiration or guys and girls that have aspirations to go to the CrossFit games or have, you know, have multiple regional or sanctional. And they're like, man, I want to go to the next level. I talk about building their team and their team isn't just them and their coach. Their team is bigger than that. Their team is them, their coach, their supporters, their, you know, a physiotherapist that can work with them, uh, maybe a chiropractor that, cause you know, because they need that or a massage, like building the group of people that are going to help you go where you need to go. If you're a novice athlete who's finishing in the 50,000 or 20,000, and eventually your goal is to be say top 1000. Well, then you need to start building your team and your team might yeah. include a training partner or, or two or three different training partners. That lady who's really good at gymnastics at your gym, mm -hmm. maybe you need to train with her to improve your Ooh, gymnastics. Here's a question. Go. If I'm that person. <laughs> is this you? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it could be me. Yeah. Um, it's not. But if I'm, you know, not going to make it through and I'm working, Kyle Roof said, I need to start working on my team. Who's the first hire? Mm. Who's the first recruit for I'll my let, team? I'll let you answer first. What position am I feeling to get the most bang for my team buck if I'm only bringing on one person? At yeah, first? I mean, I, I would hire a coach first because I want some direction in my training. And then hopefully if you you hire a good coach, then they can kind of help put, the, put all the pieces to the puzzle together for you. That's what I was going to say is hire someone who can assess you. So a, a yeah. coach who can actually take you and assess you relative to the sport. If what you want to do is get better at the sport of CrossFit. The first thing you need to do is hire a coach who can give you objective feedback about what you need to get better at. Because most of the athletes that I've brought on board throughout the almost 10 years that I've been doing remote coaching, their assessment of what they need to get better at is not necessarily an accurate representation of what they need to get better at to get better at the sport. Like what they think their low hanging fruit is, yeah. is often not the lowest hanging fruit. Right. And so I think that would getting objective feedback about what you actually need to get better at in the sport would be number one. Where does, where does training partner come in? I remember back in the day, in like 2015, uh, with Barbell Shrug, we interviewed Rich and he was saying, give me a training partner over a coach any day. Where do you, yeah, which, I mean, where's your stance on that? He's, he's more elite. So he's not in the people who aren't going to go to stage two category, but where do you I fall mean, on that? Rich has always done things on his own too. So that's, that, uh, that's going to always be his opinion. I don't think it would ever change. He also is a coach. Right. Who can assess himself critically and there's not, and, and has had people in his corner who could help him assess himself. But it probably would have been better just being completely honest. If he had someone else that was an unbiased observer, you know, he's had multiple injuries now, knee and ankle and all these, and not, not to say, I mean, he's amazing. He's the, well, I think Frazier's the goat, but he's the second goat. And so the reality is though, is that what if, what if he had someone else that, and maybe he has, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I think everyone could use, even if it's not, I'm writing all of your training, someone else to help guide the process, objectively upset, uh, assess each year what's going on with them and what they need to get better at. And then also help build that team. If you talk to most people, right? Most mid-level or even high-level athletes and you talk to them, what are they going to tell you? They need to get better. Oh, I need to get my one RMs up. I got to get yeah. stronger. And you're like, wait, but you actually finish like in the thousands in every, uh, in every workout that's over 15 minutes. Do you really like, if you want to actually move to the next stage, if you want to take the next step, let's address this first. And then once we get here and get you through to the next stage, now let's start talking about building strength to be competitive with these people, but don't build your strength to be comp competitive with the people that are a stage ahead of you when yeah. you can't make it out of the first stage. Sorry. Right? Um, yeah. to circle so. back though, what, where did you fall on the, the training partner, so the non elites? So the non rich fronings who yes. aren't going to make it to stage two, where do you fall on them having a good training partner Man, as the next hire? If you're 50,000, 20,000 to 50,000 and you have someone who's in the top thousand or top 500 who has the patience to train with you and patience to kind of guide you along, let them be your coach. Let them be your training partner coach. Cause obviously they have been, that was one of the things that I was fortunate about getting into the sport is I came into the sport and, and this guy, Preston Austin, who had been multiple, that was when it was sectionals. Yeah. He, like he'd been on the podium at multiple sectionals and I came in and I was just like a fit dude who could do lots of pull-ups and I was strong. Yeah. And he's like, train with me. And it was literally the best possible introduction to the sport that I could have had yeah. two years just training with him. You are also very you're self-aware now, but you were also self-aware at the time and you knew training principles. Cause you've been so, a college swimmer. Yeah, so athlete. I had already I been agree. coaching for five years at that point, but yeah, 
I, and I agree with you. I think the danger there is that if you have someone that's better than you and you're chasing them all the time, the, I think the one, the risk for injury goes up because you're probably doing more than you need. Like you hear the story of people go, speaking of rich going out and training with rich and then they're peed up because he can just <laughs> handle the volume or someone trying to, let's say train with Frazier when he was you peeking for the games and maybe he's just doing, he's going too fast and doing too much for that person. So especially as a novice in the sport, you need to have training partners, but you also need to be thoughtful about, am I doing the right things and how much should I be doing? And that's where a coach that's not in the training process with you can help because then they're not trying to necessarily push you in the actual training. They're standing back unbiased observer saying, these are the things. And now let's pick a couple of training partners that can help you with that. So on the training partner front, uh, I think it was Chuck Liddell who talked about plus minus equals. And this is still mm -hmm. my favorite way to approach uh, building your training partner team. So you're an athlete, you have a coach. Cause like we talked about, I think if you're someone who wants to be at the top level of the sport, I'm probably biased cause I am a coach, but I have a coach Yeah. and I'm trying to be at the top levels of the sport, whether it's as a team or masters or whatever it is. I'm, I'm trying to be the Who's top your level. coach, Adam Rogers, hey, yo. long time, la long time TTT coach, <laughs> uh, plus minus equals. So you have your training partner. Your plus is someone that can beat you in pretty much everything that you yep. do. Now, in the sport of CrossFit, it's always going to be a little funky, right? So if you and I were training together, typically in most CrossFit workouts, you'd be a plus, right? You would beat me in the majority of the stuff that we do. But there are certain workouts, you bring in muscle up elements, high volume chest to bars, things like that. Well, now you're no longer a plus in those workouts. Those are workouts that I could beat you in. But for the most part, you'd be a plus. Then I have an equals. That would be someone like Mike, where 50% of the time, depending on the workout structure, yeah. Mike's going to win. 50% of the time, I'm going to win. Yeah. So like I go into, a, I go into a training session with Mike and it's like, I've got a chance, right? Yeah. If I do, if I play my game, right, I've got a chance. Right. And then you have your minus. So this is the person who you're guiding along. And as a coach, you know, I feel like often the advantage to having minuses is that you're setting the example is that it keeps you from being a hypocrite where I agree. you tell them you got to cool down. You tell them you got to do this breath work. You tell them you need to do effective warmups and then you're not doing it. That's the value of the minus. Yeah. Yeah. I love I, that concept. No, I, I think that that is exactly where, especially a novice needs to start. But you know, if it's a coach that's helping you with that, or if you have good training partners, it's just making sure that you find a balance where you're not always getting beat up. And if you are, then that's where you need to kind of, again, self-assess. Oh, let's on. do the question I asked earlier, but now for the plus minus equals. Okay. So I'm hiring my, my I'm, I'm going to hire my first training partner, buddy. Wait, you're hiring a training partner, you know, to be part of my team. How much are you paying them? No, I'm not really paying anybody <laughs> shit, but I'm bringing them on as part of my team. Cause Kyle yeah. Ruth on the podcast said, I need one. Yeah. Well, who do I find first? The plus, the minus, or the equal? Which one's going to bring more value if I only can find one of those? Equal. Yeah, I think I'd probably bring on someone that's better, that that has knowledge. Not just, oh, he's an athlete, but he's kind of dumb. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like someone can that you give me an example of an athlete who's kind of dumb? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I almost said a name. I'm not doing that. Uh, uh, tell me off air. <laughs> if you have someone that's better, but also thoughtful in the sport, and you, like you said, Hey, we need to cool down. Hey, we need to warm up those kind of things. That's very, very helpful. Yeah. Finding someone who's, I would agree that if you can find a really good plus who's, like I said, has the patience it's hard to, to help bring you along. I feel like that would be really good. But I also think someone that is at the same level of, as you, where you guys are battling head to head where, sure. because all right, motivation, talk about motivation versus discipline, right? The person who's the plus likely feeds off discipline. They're as good as they are because they've been doing it and they've created systems for themselves. And what you could learn from them is what those systems are and figure out how to adapt those for, for yourself. With the equals, you're going to get motivation every day because there's always yeah. a possibility that you're going to win. When you're training with a plus, I, I moved here and I trained with Travis a lot. Yeah. You know, want to know how many times I won a workout? I think <laughs> two. And I remember them both vividly, <laughs> right? It's like, Every day, what, how much motivation did I have to train where every day I was going to come in and get pummeled? Yeah. That's not fun. It's hard. Yeah. It, that's hard. Now, I, I learned a lot watching, learning techniques and things like that. But at the same time, from a motivation perspective, it was just a- How long did it take down. till you were actually like mentally out of it? Two years. It, oh, wait, you kept up for two years and then you were like, this is killing me. I kept up for two years and then I was like, I no, can't- No, but at no point were you like, it just switched on after two years. Like, fuck, I can't do this. No, anymore. I couldn't. I, like my body wouldn't- 
keep up with it. That was really what it was. Oh, well, that was longer and than I was expecting you to The volume say. that he was doing at the time but I didn't, was super I high. I didn't too. do everything with Travis. It was just like we, it was yeah, me. Yeah, we throw down. When, when TTT moved here, it was just me, Brandon, and Travis. And then Max would come out on the floor occasionally. And snatch 310 pounds. And then walk back <laughs> into it. That was TT, like OG TTT. Yep. And we just trained together until my body wouldn't hold it. And Brandon's body wouldn't hold yeah. up. And Travis Tra just kept rolling. Travis is still resilient. <laughs> He's still out there. In fact, I think he might be out there right now. <laughs> yeah. Just and be better than he's ever been. <laughs> it's I know. crazy. Nuts. Yeah. I mean, I, I, th I agree with you that having an equals definitely is, is a, a good addition. I think you need to have both. The, the thing with the minus is it's very easy then to just get lax and then just like, I always can beat that person. And then you're never pushing yourself. So, but you need that. You need those wins every once in a while. Also, how much value are you providing to that minus? If you have never, like if, if, the minus says, I want to be a regional athlete and you've never been a regional <laughs> athlete. How much yeah. value are you really providing right. for them? No, that is my true. equals is like a competitive female athlete <laughs> and they usually still be me <laughs> <laughs> at the same weight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Oh uh, man. Was that a slight dig at competitive female athletes? Oh, it no. was meant to be one at me, but I guess depending on how you look at it, uh, how would you fare against Cal in whatever Cal workout she's me. doing on Actually, that Actually, you know what's funny is we did her stats for, um, one of the throwdowns and it had like her max deadlift or something. And I was actually disappointed that she wasn't beating me by way more. <laughs> <laughs> what Wait. is your lifetime max deadlift? Chris? I'm really curious. Uh, it was like, um, all the plates, it was at rich Froning's house in his garage and it was just all the colored plates that he had. And, um, so I think it ended up being like four thirty five. If you put That's them all solid, on there, yeah. but <laughs> when I got to the top, I farted in Ellie's face. <laughs> <laughs> she was sitting right next to me. <laughs> Uh, uh, my Chris. fault. <laughs> <laughs> Too much pressure. I don't even did know. you have a belt on? I think I, I just did. There's a picture of it somewhere. <laughs> the very strong Balsalva. <laughs> the, the pressure had to escape somewhere. Uh, and knowing Chris. She was a good sport about it. Knowing Chris, there's only one pl place that pressure's going to escape. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Walking around. Yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> there's no way we can segue back to the open <laughs> after that one. Hey, y'all have any good CrossFit fart stories? No, I have the, so I love this thing. It's called the breath belt. I use it all the time. Keep my back feeling good, but it's an elastic belt, right? So you, it's like two layers. You put it on and you put the second layer on and it's tight and it's like constantly squeezing. And man, if you've, if you've got a fart, that thing is going to squeeze them straight yeah. out of you. Have you and, ever done it with double unders? And it's like, no, I do remember, I do remember there's a period of time where every time I get up to do a handstand push up, a kipping handstand push up at the bottom of the, man, every single one, it was, like a, it was a period of like two weeks where that, like, what is going on with me? I literally can't keep it in. <laughs> oh shit. Oh man. All right. Well, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that was like okay. a lot of really good. You want to tell them the good folks what we got uh, on deck for the open this year? Okay. So yeah. every year, obviously TTT puts out lots and lots of information uh, around the open. And I think this year we've got probably our best lineup of info. So Thursday night, Chris is going to stay up super late sitting in his, his office right here. Thank you, Chris. And he's going to be putting together all of our, our like first thoughts. So You've got what? What's what do you have coming up? Yeah, it's so basically going to be the throwdown. That will be our basically. We're going to talk over whoever demos the workout. So yeah, we'll go of, through. Instead if, of our athletes, we'll just use the yeah, HQ it'll, stuff. It'll be a little bit more detailed. Uh, we'll do what you and I have done in years past, where basically we come on and we give you, hey, here are the athletes that tested it. Their splits. Here's what we would recommend for elite athletes, RX athletes, maybe intermediate, and we'll kind of try to use some percentages, like top ten percent. This is probably where you need to be. Again, those are all guesstimations, but we'll give you some ideas on that. What we would do for basic strategization of, of the, the workout. And then you guys will go out and demo a warm up or a couple warm ups for different types of athletes. You guys being Mike and I. You, yeah, you and Mike. So that'll the be two, a separate video that's all about how to warm up specifically for the workout. Yeah. And that's Mike and I because Mike and I need the most warm up to do anything. <laughs> yeah. So it'll be perfect then. Exactly. So you throw that on the night before you do the workout. I, I would do say that when you get in. Here's how I would consume it. So I would. Consume the first thoughts first, first thoughts first. Um, that way you can start to work on your competitor's manual. So yeah. watch first thoughts, open up your competitor's manual and fill out that chart that I put together in yep. there, right? Get that whole thing filled out. Then watch the warm up one and then take those ideas and kind of massage them based on what you know about your needs for warm up and then construct your warm up. Then when you show up, to go do your workout, whether it's Friday night or Saturday morning or whenever you're going to do it, there's literally no unknowns, yeah. right? 
you've watched the entire video, you've built your strategy, you have your warm up. you can take that thing, you can send it to your coach, you can send it to turn your it friend. sideways. Yeah, you can turn it sideways. <laughs> and then what? for those Stick that- it straight up your candy ass. <laughs> those that need to do a repeat, Max will do a, basically here's how we would attack your repeat workout yep. or demo for the repeat workout. Chris, when does that come out? That will come out. Um, well, when were, when are people supposed to be doing their repeat? Yeah, we're going to probably put I that think out it comes out Saturday, sa Saturday or Saturday? Sunday, depending on how many scores we get in. We want to basically, we're going to try to give you guys the most accurate repeat information that we can. And then obviously the most accurate first thoughts information that we can. We're going to dial up all the information that we have, look at what the scores are. Here's where you need to be for top 10%. And then we'll deliver that either Saturday or Sunday morning, yeah, but people Saturday. won't do it until Monday. So they'll yeah. have time. But then for those that are on the bubble, definitely watch that because you're going to have to repeat no matter what. So at least get a better idea of like, Hey, if this was you and you messed up on the chest of bar set, then this is probably what we'd recommend. And there'll be some detailed information in there. The, you know, we didn't talk about this, but the other people who will have to repeat are people who make mistakes with like counting, judging, yeah, for sure. movement standards and things like that. So if you are someone who is kind of a shoe in, make sure you go back and review your video yes. and don't be someone who gets caught, uh, cutting reps. And then the last thing we're going to have the podcast during the open is going to be hijacked by the classroom team. Me, Adam and Max are going to basically review the workouts. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, here's how we would train for these workouts. Here's how we'd create training progressions for, you know, the toes to bar element of the workout, the dumbbell elements of workout. And here's how we'd mix it all together to actually improve performance for somebody. Um, we're all going to take a, a different element. Each of the three of us are going to kind of present a different element of the workout and kind of attack it, break it down and, and just kind of, you know, be, as, as thorough of an analysis as possible. So just nerding out on the workout. Nerding yeah. out how to get better. And know. I think that the value there is for all athletes, not just those that don't make it through the top 10% of like, yep. oh, how do I get better at stage one? But like everyone can get better no matter how good you are at toes to bar. Like here are a couple of training ideas for toes to bar. And you can you listen can. to those ideas why it's like, well, I want to say exactly. pointing it. What's yeah. the word? Po po I don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> you know the word <laughs> I'm looking for, right? <laughs> pointing in it. Pointing in it. Yeah. You can listen to it while it's still fresh in your head. Yeah. And that then can kind of, as you go through the rest of the open season, wherever your season ends, you can take those ideas that you guys have and then use those in your off season training. Yeah. And then if your coach is one of those people that's in that video, you can be like, coach, I want to do that thing that you talked about <laughs> yeah. in the video. All right. Like, okay. Done. I'll, I'll take them too. Thanks yeah. guys. <laughs> All right. That's it, right? Yes. Yeah, get the Air high five. <laughs> Music. And thank you for listening to another Corpus Animus podcast. Woo! Until another time, my friends.